Hi, I'm Arun Sukumar. Uh, I'm an assistant editor with The Hindu, and joining me from the other end of the internet is Patrick Mayer. Uh, Patrick is a digital humanitarian and a crisis mapper. He is a, a pioneer among a new generation of technologists who've used the power of social media to identify people and places worst affected by humanitarian disasters. and and also introduce social media into what some would consider is a realm of the political. Thanks for joining in, Patrick. Uh, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, three notable uh, crises uh, or humanitarian crises that have taken place in the last month. Uh, the earthquake in Balochistan, uh, the, the hostage crisis in Kenya, which was recently diffused, and uh, communal violence in Muzaffarnagar in Western Uttar Pradesh in India. Let's begin with uh, the uh, earthquake in Balochistan, which has, I think, taken at least nearly 400 lives, and relief efforts are still on as we speak. I know you were involved in, in, in mapping the crisis and coordinating humanitarian efforts. Can you tell us a bit uh, about that? Well, the response that we... Um, coordinated following the earthquake in Pakistan had a very limited impact, uh, and I can, I can explain why. We had a request um, by UN OCHA, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs in Pakistan, to identify tweets that were related or referenced uh, disaster damage and also referenced uh, tweets. But at the end of the day, the the regions, the disaster-affected regions' social media footprint is is very, very, very light. By which you so mean the number of people in uh, in Balochistan who actually use modes of social media. That's right. People who 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 frequently use uh, Twitter, in particular, because that's what we were asked to to monitor. Um, and the experience there was very different from the experience we had in the Philippines during Typhoon Pablo. So if, if you were to call a crisis mapping exercise successful, how would it typically work when a humanitarian crisis has broken out? How would you separate the rumors from, uh, you know, from real pressing needs that people have who have been affected by a disaster? That's a, that's a major challenge. So within the Standby Task Force, which is an online digital humanitarian volunteer group, uh, we have a team that's dedicated uh, to verification, so a verification team whose only purpose is to try, if at all possible, to verify user January content posted online. Now, it may sound like that's impossible, but our colleagues at the BBC have been doing this since 2005, a year before even Twitter was launched. And this is the BBC's user-generated content hub, UGC hub, again, based out of London, who've all developed these tactics and strategies to verify social media content. And we've piggybacked on, on those uh, strategies and adapted that skill set. Of course, Could you, could you give us an example? example? You know, uh, uh, on an image, for example, if an image is su supposedly showing uh, earthquake damage from from uh, Pakistan, you could look at the uh, the EXIF data of that particular image to see whether it was actually geo-referenced there and what the timestamp is. If it's timestamped for two years ago, mm -hmm. then you know there's something wrong. You know, what I call information forensics is really what you're doing to unpack uh, the evidence you, you have. So what's the technical expertise involved in conducting a crowdsourcing ex you know, an exercise? So I'm guessing language would be a problem if you are engaging in a crisis mapping exercise in a part of the world where English is not English or any of the other major languages are not uh, the, the primary sort of means of communication. Uh, plus, what, what is the sort of technical expertise that you need to coordinate this to conduct the verification exercise that you're talking about? Um, that's a good question. Now, in terms of the language, you know, we have volunteers in 80 different countries around the world. Uh, a member of the Digital Humanitarian Network is a group called Translators Without Borders, oh, and that's what they specialize in as well. So that's how we address the language issues, as well as obviously looking at machine translation. Often what you really need is uh, not necessarily a perfect translation, but a good enough translation that tells you what, who, where, when. Now, in terms of what skill sets does it take, it really depends uh, what level you're talking about. Some volunteers, all they want to do is, uh, uh, and have time for is clicking on images and clicking on tweets, and, and that's, that's what they, they want to do. Uh, others who want to do maybe p become part of the verification team mm -hmm. will join our verification team where we have coordinators 
who have been doing this for a few years. Coming to the, the crisis in Kenya where Al-Shabaab attacked the Mullen Westgate. Um, and Al-Shabaab is a terrorist organization that's pretty savvy on Twitter. I mean, it's it's maintained a, an active presence, uh, and despite Twitter's many attempts to, um, I, I think, uh, remove its account, it sort of surfaced then and again. Um, not, not, not just uh, the fact that you have actors who are who are doing mischief, who are probably uh, sending out false data. How would you coordinate uh, with state parties, with the police, or with uh, uh, you know enforcement agencies when there is a crisis that is breaking live, and your main objective is to keep as many people as safe as possible? I don't have. I'm not going to have a perfect answer or even a, a partial answer. The fact is, when it comes to uh, political violence, um, uh, direct violence, conflict, and so on, it's a whole whole other can of worms um, from a data protection, data privacy perspective, from the issue of uh, veracity and credibility of tweets uh, as well. It does become uh, much more challenging. So one of the uh, great things that Storyful has put together um, which is very similar in some respects to what we've done in Disaster for Humanitarian Response is create an open newsroom where journalists around the world are connected and they'll post, you know, updates to breaking news. They'll ask for, you know, they'll say, hey, I just heard, I just got this video. Can right. anybody authenticate Have you found that the government is um, happy to have a team of crisis mappers or a team or, or a group that's really sort of identifying and sifting through information have have governments been you know uh, reluctant to accept that sort of data so we we do not we the the digital humanitarian network and the standby volunteer task force do not work with governments uh, we support humanitarian organizations large and small uh, around the world who require search capacity to do this kind of real time information uh, management if governments were indeed planning to um, you know, map their crisis, not just the humanitarian disasters, but uh, the natural humanitarian disasters, but also man-made crises. Because in India, you've had this instance of communal violence in Western Uttar Pradesh, where we had fake YouTube videos circulating, um, morphed newspaper headlines uh, being circulated on Facebook. Now, if the governments in uh, in countries which does not have, which which do not have really sophisticated technology, where to undertake such a crisis mapping exercise? What would be the sort of expertise, or what would be the sort of capabilities that they would require? That's a great question. I think the model to follow um, from a government angle is probably the Filipino government. They they appear to be one of the most sort of forward thinking enlightened governments when it comes to leveraging social media for operational uh, disaster uh, response. And, but I think a lot of it is, is really uh, education, is, is understanding the best practices and lessons learned that have been documented already by these digital humanitarian networks right. and by other forward-thinking digital, um, other forward-thinking uh, traditional humanitarian organizations like the American Red Cross like the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, who tend to be uh, on the leading edge of innovation within established humanitarian organizations and see what, what they do and what they do best. And I think a key component of this will also be um, having an, a, a volunteer network that um, mm -hmm. the government can depend on for yeah. that search capacity when you have a mass volume of user-generated uh, content. And I think lastly, one thing that, that the Filipino government has really, really figured out and gotten and, and done very, very well is they create demand for reports via social media. They, in if it's a typhoon or flooding, if there it's if it's an, a hazard that is uh, can be anticipated, they'll already go on social media, Facebook and Twitter and other platforms, and let people know what hashtags to use. Let people know what to report using what particular hashtags. So they are they're raising awareness and they're structuring right. the way that people are going to report information. And that's incredibly, incredibly important. It's not just about being passive monitoring, yeah. but it's being actively soliciting relevant information is absolutely key. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Patrick, and offering us a glimpse into how the world of crisis mapping works. My pleasure, and anytime. All right, thanks.